Okay, I am officially recording this. Um, so all of you, I ask that you be on your best behavior, but we're doing that just, just so we can share this, uh, this panel with anyone who can't actually physically be here or virtually be here. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to all of you for coming. Um, my name is Tim Henningsen, I'm the chair of the instruction committee. Um, I want to sort of point out my close colleague, Jen Kelly, who has helped facilitate these events. Um, we tend to run a couple of these every semester and we're really excited about today's uh, topic, which we've called, So You Think Your Students Don't Read. Um, I wanna share a very quick anecdote um, that I experienced uh, shortly after starting at COD before I turn it over to our panelists. Um, Shortly after being hired at COD, I was given my first literature class to teach. And I remember I went to one of my senior colleagues to ask like what sort of advice they would give me in terms of des designing a syllabus and assignments and what sort of things I should expect. And so I went to the senior colleague and the very first thing he said to me, he said, good luck getting your students to read, all right? And I was sort of aghast by that because I thought, geez, I've taught literature classes before at other colleges and I've never really had a problem with that issue. Um, and I was also sort of upset because I want to be like, my instinct is to immediately defend our students. I feel like they often, too, too, too often they get this sort of bad end of the stick. Um, and so I was, I was really upset by that. Um, however, there is something to be said for that advice that this colleague of mine gave media analysis of uh, what students are currently doing and what sort of habits they form, you will find that a significant number of our own students are not doing all of the readings that we are asking them to do, all right? And um, based on some of the language in um, that New York Times report, which I'm actually going to uh, share with you guys, I just posted a link in the chat. You'll be able to find sort of a description of this panel and also a short bio of all of our panelists, but there's also a link in there to a New York Times story that was done a couple years ago which articulated that students are just like, they're sort of self-interested and they're not willing to do work. And I was really frustrated by the way that that article articulates um, our students, but I think that there is a problem that exists here. And that's why I'm really excited to introduce our three panelists who are going to sort of uh, talk to us a little bit about this issue, students reading in college. And I don't know that we'll come to any great epiphanies here today, but I'm really fascinated to hear. We have um, three experienced uh, faculty who I think have a lot of interesting things to share with us today. So um, I'm going to skip the sort of biographies. If you want, just use the link that I've put in the chat and you can sort of see the backgrounds that all three of these folks have. They're all very, very impressive. Um, but I would like to introduce Liz Adamas, Judy Carino and Jason Ertz. Um, and Liz, if it's okay with you, um, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I would just ask all of you, if you have questions, you can feel free to post them in the chat. Um, you, the way these instruction panels work is each panelist is going to be given about 10 minutes to share some information with you, after which we'll conduct a Q&A. So um, I would just ask that all of you exercise good Zoom etiquette, keep your mics muted. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat. Otherwise, wait to ask those questions until we open up the floor. I'll allow everybody to unmute their mics uh, in about a half an hour after we've gone through these panels. So um, Liz, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the floor is officially yours. Hey, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Liz Adamas, and I'm actually a relatively new faculty member at the College of DuPage. Um, I started last fall um, in the English department teaching developmental reading and writing. So um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm a little nervous. I haven't done one of these before. So if I miss like a question in the chat, I always do that during class. Someone just, I don't know, give me a sign or something. Um, but let's see how this goes. All right. Okay. So um, everybody can see my screen. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the strengths that I think our students bring to the classroom because I too similarly was like, oh, I don't like the take on this article. It was so negative. And I do think our students, I think there is a real challenge around reading for our students, but I do think our students bring a lot to the table. Um, and then talk about some of the challenges and a lot of them um, being a developmental reading teacher and also having a background in middle and high school teaching. I think a lot of it has to do with the, um, the difference in demands from high school to college. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then um, I'm going to end by 
talking about some strategies that um, I think that my students have reported to me and faculty I've worked with that that people can apply across their discipline to support um, reading habits with their students. So, all right, so I think it's, I mean, this is just the start of a list. I'm sure we could come up with lots of things, but I think it is really important to start from a position of strength. Our students do bring so much to the table. They are bright, they're motivated, they've chosen to come to college. They are very social media savvy. Um, in some ways that makes them very connected. I know there's a another side to that, but in some ways they do have a, a connection that a lot of us didn't have. Um, and they're also really versatile and hardworking, right? Then most of them are going to school, they have tremendous family responsibilities, they have jobs. And so they are very good at having all of these different competing priorities um, and their work ethic is incredible. So, um, however, I think they do often come to us with a lot of reading challenges. And I think, um, so just to talk about a couple of them. So most of my developmental students will report that they have not read a full book since middle school. Um, and so when they're asked in my class to read a full text or to read and annotate 100 pages between classes and, and come in and lead a class discussion, that's new to them. They also um, report that in high school, they were not required to use reading to um, to learn complex information, that ideas were present, complex ideas were taught to them, but it wasn't necessarily through the reading, right? It was very much scaffolded and broken down by their teacher, teachers. And because of that, then they often struggle. They'll say, oh, I know how to annotate or I know how to summarize. But if you dig a little deeper, they don't know how to do that independently. And they don't understand how that might work differently in different disciplines. Um, and then the last one is time management. And I just keep coming back to this. I know it's not a reading strategy, but, you know, our students are, most of them are new to college or they're, you know, returning to school after many years and they have so much on their plate. And I keep, like I started taking grad school classes again this fall and the executive functioning to manage a family and a job and a class and a, right. And what they're being asked to do is really incredible. And it's, and they're very new at it. Um, and I think that is a big challenge that gets in the way of their, their ability to read and focus their time on it. So, um, so how can we support our students? So a couple of things that um, over the years that I have found have really worked is I think um, many students feel alone, right? They think I, they just will say, I'm a terrible reader, or I'm a terrible writer. But as much as we can explicitly name and acknowledge that the demands of college reading are very different from high school, and then they can start having that conversation and talking about, we talk a lot about like, well, how is it different from high school? And they'll say like, I had to read 10 pages and answer fact and detail questions, right? And now I have to do this and I don't even know where to start. Um, so as much as I think as we can can name that for them and normalize it, because it, because it is hard, um, and also support their executive functioning around it, right? So in my developmental courses, we do a lot of work around like, okay, so how long did it take you to read that? Okay, well, how long then does that mean it's gonna take you to read the whole assignment, right? Or, okay, you're confused, so what do you do, right? So sort of like managing that process because it's very new to them or, or even things about like, how much time should you be studying? They're used to going to school every day and having a teacher check in and if they don't understand, someone knows, but they'll say, oh, I didn't do the reading and now it's three weeks later, I thought we were done and now I'm failing the class and it you know was on the exam. So um, I think as much as, I mean, we even do like sometimes like a weekly schedule, when will you study? Where will you, where will you have a space that you won't be distracted? Um, and then the next one, so I often hear from, from faculty members like, well, I'm a biology teacher, like I'm not a reading teacher, how am I supposed to do this? And I, and I think that's a very valid um, concern. And I think that um, we often forget that in our disciplines, we have a tremendous amount of reading and writing expertise that's automatic to us, but that students don't know. Right. And so I think as much as possible that, you know, we can show students and talk to students about, you know, how does reading and writing work in biology? Right. How do how do experts in the field communicate 
scientific ideas? How are texts structured? Like what is an abstract in an article? You know, those sort of things and, and talk about how it's different between disciplines, how there is some overlap, right, in the social sciences, but that it does look different and that we actually, we know a lot about that being experts in our field. And as much as we can articulate that to students, it's helpful. Um, and then the last one is, is I think, um, while we are incredibly, you know, crammed with the amount of content we want to get into our courses, particularly at the beginning of the semester, as much as possible is that we can model and teach and provide opportunities to practice um, some reading strategies in our discipline means that it will go a long way in the end, right? So how do I read a scholarly article? Or how do I compose a lab report? And, and getting those pieces in place at the beginning will really then they'll fly at the end. Um, and so now I just want to talk about like a couple of different reading strategies that um, can be applied across disciplines that students have, have said have been helpful to support their reading process. Um, so before reading, I think lots of times students will read something, they'll be like, I have no idea what it is, I read it again, I still have no idea what it is, and now I'm done, right? Um, and I think things like as much as possible as we can get students to get in the habit across disciplines to preview the material you're going to be reading, right? Look at text structure. How does it fit with how texts are typically structured in our discipline? What does this mean? Where should I be queuing in? Like, what does the conclusion mean? Or how is the, the, the questions organized so that they can, they can have an idea of that? Um, I also think background knowledge is really important. This is a pretty um, hot button topic in the field of reading right now, I think, and Jason's giving a thumbs up. I think it is everywhere. And there are, there are kind of two ways to come at this. So one thing is, is explicitly asking students to activate their own background knowledge, right? That's an activating background knowledge is what do you already know about this? What have we already done this semester that gives you some context? What do you know from previous experiences? So asking students to activate that in their brain. Um, but the other piece of this is as faculty, you know, there's all, been all this research done about students, if they don't have like some key pieces to inform how they read something, they're never going to understand it. And sometimes our students are missing those key background knowledge pieces and then everything falls apart. And so as much as we can as faculty to sort of scaffold before they start reading, if there's something in the article that's like informing, but it's not written about in the article, tell the students about it or tell the students about the author or the context for what they're about to read, because that will then facilitate their understanding and allow them to do things like make connections to what they've done before in their lives and predict how it's all going to fit together. And then the last one before reading, which is huge, this is really, really big, is helping students to set their purpose for reading, right? So I'll say like, how did you know what to annotate? And students will say, I don't know, it just stood out to me, right? So like, what do you have to do with the information you're reading? Are you writing a research paper? Are you, you know, doing a group project? Are you taking a multiple choice test? What do you have to do and read with that that focus, because then you'll know what to annotate. And as much as we can model that and show that to students, then when they go to do the reading, it kind of cuts out the noise. They know what they're looking for. Um, while they're reading, so all these things we want them to do, synthesizing, connecting, all of those things, um, I think, you know, annotation, I, I still am, I know it comes and goes like, I am such a firm believer in annotation, teaching students how to do it by hand, how to do it online, right? So that they, because then they can go back, right? They, can, they don't just have a whole thing that they can't make any sense out of. And modeling how you annotate in your discipline, put it up there and like model your thinking process of what you do, you know, like, oh, this is confusing or this connects to this. Um, and then paraphrasing is a big one that I think faculty, I've heard that they really like to use. Um, and, and I'll just show you, like we just did this in my class and, and students will say, oh, I know how to paraphrase. I know how to put it in my own words, but they don't. Once they do it, they just can't, they can't do it. They get hung up. Um, and so, you know, for example, like this is, we did this in my class this week where it was a text they'd read. There was a section that was really hard. We divide, divided them into groups. We read the whole thing. They each took sections and had to paraphrase it and talk together about what it means and make meaning out of it. And then 
you know, by chunking it, then they could put it all together to do a summary or key takeaways. So particularly with really challenging text, working together in teams to put it in your own words, to slow down, go sentence by sentence, not for everything, um, but that is a particularly um, good strategy. So, and some of these other ones we'll talk about more in a minute, but concept maps, I know there are a lot of people at COD doing some great work around that, but, but asking students to conceptually show what they're reading. Um, and then this reader response piece, as much as possible of um, students can have a way to like pull out their questions, to note where they were confused. And that can happen in a lot of different ways, right? I've, I have seen faculty do that through using Flipgrid. You know, this is my takeaway. This is what I didn't understand. But where they're having and being asked to personally interact with the text and bring it to the group. Um, and then after reading, um, a couple of things just to talk about. So summarizing is a really, really hard skill, I think, for our students. They'll say, again, they know how to do it, but, but when you actually dig below the surface, like, well, how do you decide what's important and what's not? Um, and so, again, modeling that for them, how you think about it in your discipline, I think is very, very helpful for students and using text structure to support that summarizing. Um, and then concept map. So this is, um, you know, asking students to make a visual representation of what they've read, showing the key points, right? And again, this is just like a sample of one a student did this semester. I said, you know, read it. I want you to pull out the main ideas and visually, you know, somehow get it on the paper, right? And so something like this, right? And they were able to take the key points, it forces them to synthesize it, to think about how the piece fits to the whole. Um, and so they don't have to always be like fancy concept maps, but just thinking about, you know, how does it fit together for you really then will pull out what you understood and you did not understand. Um, and then I'll end because I think I'm close to 10 minutes. It's just some final thoughts is um, our modeling and scaffolding, right? So again, if you can show your students how you think about it as an expert in your field, it will help them. And then scaffold that process for them. Like I think it's unrealistic to just say, go read 200 pages, right? somehow to chunk it for them, right? And hold places for that practice, right? And to make mistakes, because I think part of it is they get overwhelmed and then they just shut down and then they're like, I'm not doing the reading, right? But to, to celebrate progress and persistence, like, right, you know, my students get better. By the end of the semester, they are, you know, reading 200 pages a week in a developmental course and coming in and having the Socratic seminar about it. Or they're able to read a research article and maybe not understand everything, but to say like, oh yeah, I got to look at the abstract and the conclusion, you know, so they, they get better, but, but holding space for them to make mistakes. And then the last thing is, is, um, to focus on metacognition and transfer. And there's not enough time to talk about it here, but this is huge. And that's why I put up the picture of um, teach your students how to learn. I know that um, that was our keynote and Dr. McGuire is fantastic. And some of the reading strategies I talked about are in her book, but just this idea of students articulating what's working and what's not working for them. And the idea of transfer, right? Like what strategies can be used across disciplines, what ones can't, right? And so that they can, um, the more they can make sense of that in their mind, they will be able to better independently employ reading strategies. That's it. I'm done. How long was that? I wasn't even timing you. It was great. A okay. virtual round of applause for Professor Adamas. All right. <laughs> so thank you, Liz. Um, thank next you. up, we're going to turn to uh, Jason Ertz. Um, I am speculating here, but my sense is that Jason is going to approach this very, very differently um, than the way Liz did. So um, Jason, without further ado, the floor is yours. <clears throat> If he's still here, he might have bailed. We lost Jason, I think. Oh, good Lord. Our research librarian has disappeared. This is um, he, I'm gonna wait one second here to see if he maybe pops back in. If not, Judy, no. are, you, are, you willing to, uh, are you willing to go while we try and lo locate Jason? Of course. Okay. I might right, I'll, I'll let you take over if that's okay. 
You can have me take over. Okay. Hang on one second. Let me go to slideshow. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Okay, so so do you? I am coming from the the nursing discipline. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the nursing discipline and the amount of reading that is required. And I'm going to come from it as a, a holistic approach and gaps that I have been discovering as I work with students one on one. First of all, if you look at the first semester of students, so I had just finished an eight week course teaching students disease processes and pathophysiology versus second, third or fourth. Now I I think we might have lost Judy now too. Is the internet going out in the entire western suburbs here? I just got a text from Jason saying that his internet went dead. He's linking yeah, by his phone. Not surprising. And we have also lost Judy to the same sort of bug. Maybe they're neighbors. Um, well, technical glitches happen. Here we are. Um, Christine Liz, why don't you just take up? Oh, Jason's back, actually. Here we go. Um, yeah, Liz, you just take over the, for the next 20 minutes. No, I'm kidding. Um, I just Jason's back. Jason, are you back? There you are. Yeah, I mean, as soon as Liz was done talking. Uh, <laughs> Timing. Oh, so, um, Judy, had actually, now. Judy had started, but we also lost her. So I don't know if she's on the same <laughs> internet uh, provider as you are, but um, she has also disappeared. So if it's okay, we'll cycle back to her if we can get her. But since you're here, do you want to take over? Um, yeah, I, I, I would feel bad to but yeah, I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. That was jarring. <laughs> I took it all of it, yeah. So <clears throat> let's take a look. Let me share my screen with everybody here. Okay, you see my screen okay? Yep, it's good. Right. All right, uh, so I apologize for that. Now I'm a little bit flustered on that. That's weird. <clears throat> so uh, thanks everybody for having me. I, I uh, hope to hopefully be able to add to what Liz is kind of was Liz was kind of talking about. Um, mine is more kind of a, a a larger kind of discussion. We're not getting to more uh, the nitty gritties of uh, reading strategies and these kinds of things. But I've been looking for a number of years at this idea of deep reading. How it might differ from skim reading and, and, and how these skills might be able to work with each other and how one may take over a lot of people's abilities to read versus another one. So based on that, this is the kind of thing that uh, I, I decided to kind of take a look at. So to answer the question, do our students read? Generally speaking, the answer is no, they don't. Not the way we want them to. Right? We, we have a particular idea about what we mean by reading, and it is an incidental reading. Right? That's not what we're talking about. <clears throat> we could quip about how much our students are reading with all of the social media, text, emails, advertising, schoolwork, et cetera. But we all know this is not what we mean, <clears throat> right? The Johnson article from the Chronicle of Higher Education does discuss the statistics around um, how much of the assigned reading students do <clears throat> that we give them. And it's important to understand that it is, it is limited. Right, <clears throat> so that's an important thing to consider. Now, within that article as well, there's some great softwares that might be possible or techniques that you might consider. So this is a good article to kind of consider. Perusal is in here, which is a, a newer type of tool that I noticed a number of students are using. So one of the things is they seem to be doing a lot of incidental reading. Right, it seems to be less about quantity and more and more about quality of reading practice that we're really concerned with here. There are very different functions of reading that we should begin to recognize, whether that is reading tweets, text messages, emails, a newspaper article, or Plato's Republic. There is a concentration problem, I think, but I think a distraction problem mostly. And when it comes to deep reading and focusing on, on the writings of someone else, I, I might also argue that the digital medium has something to do with it, but evidence is still being generated around this.
Now, uh, some have argued that the digital medium potentially has the effect of a, has an effect on our reading brains, like uh, Dr. Marianne Wolf, the director of, of the Center for Reading and Language Arts. Experiments and observations have been conducted by her as well as many others on this subject. And I am compelled to agree with her, but at, as she is, I'm waiting to see the evidence. So this is something that is in fact, she's starting to uh, look into as well as others. Dr. Wirth's position is that neuroplasticity of the brain that helped make the reading brain circuitry to begin with can allow it to fade from lack of use. Neural connections do dissipate if they're not used regularly. New neural networks can be created. This happens throughout a lifetime as the brain is constantly adapting. Since this is the case, the reading circuitry that we build in our brains from learning how to read can become strong with use or weaker with lack of use. An analogy, to physical exercise might be appropriate. I have to think about that, but practice, practice, practice. And I think Liz mentioned that. The way to read well is to read a lot in many cases. In order to become an expert reader, one has to read a lot. And to read a lot, uh, Dr. Daniel Williamham, a cognitive psychologist has mentioned, to read a lot, one probably has to enjoy it. And I think this is a particular issue that we have is, is, is there elements of joy that, that come with reading or have they ever been able to experience it? So the question is, will we lose the deep reading brain in a digital culture? Dr. Wolf does make a distinction between digital reading and deep reading. There's so much information in the digital world, full of hypertext, videos on the side, other things to see, scrolling up, scrolling down, that all that our brains have their own defense strategy, which is skimming finding keywords, moving from one item to another, when we get impatient or bored or overwhelmed. In a world filled with this much information at people's fingertips, these skills will be quite useful for young people, but we cannot lose sight of deep reading, which requires time, commitment, concentration, and patience. There are advantages to both uh, ways of reading, and researchers are continuing to see how possible a biliterate brain can be. There are, they are studying the comprehension in screen reading and print reading. Uh, can we switch from an online digital reading, not, which is nonlinear, skimming, finding what we need, and clicking through hyperlinks, and that deep reading, which is linear, complex, detailed, you know, all these other types of things we, we think about when we think about deep reading. So some of the aspects of deep reading you can see here, right? Um, perspective taking, this empathy uh, factor that we see in a lot of fiction reading or, or memoirs and stuff like this. Um, that the entry process is where we see a lot of the skimming going on. It's the second two here, the metacognitive processing with the analogical thinking, which bridges our background knowledge, as Liz has, has kind of emphasized, it's the importance of bridging a, bra, bra, background knowledge and their inferences from what they're reading is incredibly important to them becoming a, an expert reader. And, and practicing uh, along these ways. There are precious milliseconds between the entry process of a particular uh, of reading something and these metacognitive and generative processes. Right, the generative processes is, is where we can see the contemplation uh, starts to form, insights, epiphanies, new reflections and novel thoughts start to exist in these, these uh, later milliseconds of, of a reading brain. But generally, Superficial, the superficial way we read in our day to day lives, right? This in incidental reading like emails, texts, messages from my kids, whatever it might be, may be affecting how we read when we need to read with more in depth understanding. So we're, we're bringing one reading strategy from getting through all my emails and texts to a more uh, detailed text. Like if we were reading an excerpt from the public or, or a short story, um, bringing this, those same strategies over is probably not going to be. Um, some terminology issues, as I was kind of was looking into this, reading, I don't know this is a, is a uh, technical term. It might be uh, slowly but surely, but uh, reading comprehension, close reading, we see critis literary criticism, and then some, some other types of terminology and cognitive processes. As we're kind of looking at the brain as well as the mind, which are two different. Another, uh, this is from Wolf's uh, Proust and the Squid book, and we kind of get a timeline of the milliseconds involved in when a, when a word actually appears. We have this Zoom meeting going. 
So um, some scholars and researchers point to the problem of distractions when it comes to digital reading. A number of studies were done illustrating that hyperlinks were distracting and led to confusion over a text. Researchers thought it would, it would help the reader enrich their understanding, but it didn't. People reading the text without hyperlinks tested with more comprehension. It turns out that evaluating links and navigating the path through them, it turned out, involves mentally demanding problem solving skills that are extraneous to the act of reading itself, from a car's book to shallows. Uh, it, it increases reading readers' cognitive load and makes it difficult for them to comprehend and retain what they're in fact reading. Uh, there's lots of information on cognitive load and working memory. And I think Richard E. Meyer is one of those uh, prominent scholars that kind of discusses this a lot. Um, Daniel Willingham, the cognitive psychologist, also brings up this idea of working memory and cognitive load when it comes to comprehension when students are actually learning how to read, right? And so if students aren't practiced or uh, they're trying to decode unfamiliar words, their working memory is, is focused on the decoding and some of their ability to comprehend is left out of the working memory. You know, and that can be a, that's what happens with young kids are learning how to decode um, and learn to read, but comprehension isn't as good as they're figuring out the words. But once they have a, a kind of a fluency about them, comprehension does. So there is this issue of working memory and cognitive load that happens, and we need to pay attention. Switching back and forth can really be an issue. Uh, Clive Thompson, who wrote the uh, the book Smarter Than You Think, right, is a is a uh, huge advocate for technology in general. But he does recognize that the one aspect that could be a problem with all of this technology is distractions and moving about between content as a problem for attention. Uh, Daniel Willingham actually is not convinced of the changing neural reading pathway or the issues of maintaining one's, one's attention. Willingham points out that the basic architecture of cognition that gets reading done, like uh, vocabulary, background knowledge, syntactic skills, are still the main factors for developing an expert reader. Research has indicated that it is easier to read informational text or text that require focus and attention on paper than on screen, but reading a novel for fun generally doesn't present much of a problem. Willingham does point out that he thinks what might be a growing issue with screens, impatience with boredom, and with them, distractions. Right, this instant gratification problem. Now, this is no fault of the students, it's just kind of how they were been brought up, for lack of a better way to say it. Right? They're brought up in this particular environment. This instant gratification comes with scrolling, flipping between YouTube videos, uh, starting to read or view something, and then getting bored and moving on because there's always something else to fill the space, right? And we can apply this same exact uh, scenario to a television. In the golden age of television of which we sit, there's always something the student can watch to take away their time. So any issue of being slightly bored there's always something that can take their attention and easily flip around. And so this is, this is a particular issue. And I would still contend to some degree. So uh, you know, Willingham does indicate that it's less about attention, you know, maintaining one's attention, and it's very much about this impatience with boredom. Kurt Cobain may have said it best, entertainment or something of this nature, right? Um, uh, he also doesn't really, um, Willingham doesn't say that it isn't really an issue of displacement. Because the um, fact of the matter is, we didn't read a lot before the digital revolution, and it's quite possible that uh, it didn't have that much of an effect because of the uh, poor, poor uh, rates. So is this a problem? Maybe. Maybe. We don't know yet if this is really going to be a problem. But there are uh, cognitive neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, reading specialists who are all trying to work into this issue. So what's at stake here? There are these precious milliseconds seconds when uh, these deep reading circuits are developed. And it is these milliseconds where the, the metacognitive and generative kind of processes happen that are short circuited when it comes to distractions and partial attention and skimming, right? Skipping those last milliseconds of a deep reading process can be uh, detrimental to the development of that. Now, uh, a couple of things to pay attention to with this is that as, as adults are reading circuitry may have been dissipated. But uh, based on when we kind of all were raised, 
it's quite likely that many of us were, you know, developed a deep reading and process, a deep reading circuitry within our, our, our childhood. One of the issues today now is, is that young students, young children who are from the beginning immersed in the digital medium, do they ever have the opportunity to actually develop those deep reading skills and get into that point of understanding? I mean, we can rebuild our circuitry, right? Dissipation doesn't mean disappearing, right? But so we can kind of rebuild if we haven't practiced enough. And you'll notice it. And, you know, I think Nicholas Carr's is Google making me stupid article is a, is a reflection of himself. And I think that's kind of where I got these ideas from and where I kind of started looking into this is that, yeah, I, I'm having a difficult time reading uh, this book that I never had a problem with. So, these are things. So, um, so what can we do about it, right? I quote Dr. Roof with this, is the same plasticity that allows us to form a reading brain, reading circuit to begin with and, and short circuit the development of a deep reading if we allow it also allows us to to learn how to duplicate this deep reading in a new environment. We cannot go backwards. As children move more towards an immersion in digital media, we have to figure out ways to do it there. And I think that's really the case. Uh, while it is clear from the experiments and evidence thus far that, that digital technologies and the medium itself do have some kind of physiological or cognitive effect on the brain, much like reading itself had on the language and oral traditions of the past, right? For that, you can see Socrates' lament to the Phaedrus. But it is necessary that we begin the training of a biliterate brain. <clears throat> now, this is kind of a newer idea. I think, uh, I don't know how many people have really subscribed to it. But while digital mediums have provided new capacities and activated brain function, we do not want to lose those traditional skills of deep reading. Tax depth and complexity in our world still exist continue to be of cultural importance for this foreseeable future. So we should still be training it and requiring it and practicing it along with digital medium skimming, processing, searching, decision making, and problem solving. Deep reading does uh, require regular practice and exercise. I cannot stress that. On digital technologies, as Carr might have indicated, it leaves less time for uh, deep reading practice. And with that, it becomes harder to do and, and want to do it, which is basically Willingham's position. So it's important that we, uh, that we, when it comes to reading through digital mediums and deep reading, the question is not really is one better than the other. It should not be an either or issue. The question should be, how do we train for both deep and digital reading and use both well? Can we learn how to deep read within the digital medium? That's another question that uh, everyone is constantly asking. And we have to be careful since we still cannot know fully how digital technologies and digital uh, medium affect the reading circuit and or reading, which is a big issue. I think uh, Tim Clifford mentioned that. We uh, should be fully aware about how our choices today in forming the reading process can change our world. So that's it. <laughs> Jason, thank you very much. Kudos, that was great. Um, I'm actually going to, just so all of you uh, in the audience are aware, um, I will certainly collect the uh, slides from the panelists and make sure to share them. So if there are any, there's additional reading that all of you wanna do, no pun intended, um, I'll share that with you um, after the fact. Uh, Judy, you're back, you're alive. Yes, I'm sorry, the internet went out a few times, literally right as I started, so. Same with Jason, so like you guys got the, the, the internet plague crazy. today or something, so. Yeah. Um, right. Well, if you're ready now, you can uh, sort of pick up. We got, we got to your second slide, so why don't you just start there? Yes. Yeah. Sure, so I think we were talking about, I had gotten to, you know, the approach that I was going through as, as to what I see when I work with students on a one-on-one. -on -one. So first things first is that when students get to, especially, you know, a past first semester, even in first semester, one of the questions they start off asking is, do I need to read the book? 
And I look at them and they say, do you really want to ask your instructor that? And I talk to them about how reading really is essential because especially in the nursing discipline in the first semester, they are inundated with three very heavy courses. After that, they are in one course every eight hours that have lecture, a lab, a simulation, and a clinical. They have four different components. And so reading most definitely is essential. I tell them reading is essential. They should read for content and comprehension. And when pressed for time, they should really look at the emphasis of what, what is being emphasized during class and then read the content and comprehension to coincide with that. And then our students get a book bundle. So do they do web-based reading versus text-based reading? Because there are actually research out there that say that web-based readers, or if they're reading say an electronic book, they only really read about 20% of what they, they are looking at, as opposed to if they're actually looking at a textbook. But there are a couple of things that it comes to reading that they're, what I'm finding when I work with students one on one is huge gaps in different things. Our students also as average age runs around 30, 34, and it's getting younger, but the time management as to when they're pressed for time, they start to get choosy with what they read. So are they, first of all, planning for daily review, like reading a little bit every day. I say you should be reading a little bit every day, you should be reviewing. How are you managing other commitments, especially with family or work? We have students that are not successful in our program when they're, they have, especially in first semester, they're working 40 hours managing family commitments and then trying to decide, okay, do I read or not read? Do I go by the PowerPoint or do I go by what is emphasized in class? And then in note taking and highlighting, you have those who read and decide to take notes on the whole book or they highlight the entire book, especially in nursing. So there are those moments where I see them either absorbing too much information or not enough. And the fact that in the nursing discipline has to build upon their critical thinking, they need to read for understanding and then move away from memorization. To give you a historical perspective, because I have, I do have an interest in reading, especially the gaps in what I'm seeing. I myself was a, a ELL student, and I also have a 10 year old who has an IEP for reading, auditory and language processing issues. And so way back in year 2000, the National Reading Panel Report was actually a report of 14 scholars that looked at uh, research on reading K through 12, and they looked at probably over 100,000 research studies on actually what are the essential components of reading, which includes these five things, phonomic awareness, phonics, oral reading fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. So we're looking at, okay, the, from the way sounds are being spoken to how they're recognizing the relationship between written and spoken words to the understanding what words mean, being able to articulate them, being able to articulate and understand meanings of words, which in our nursing students struggle a lot with vocabulary and comprehension pieces. In vocabulary especially, they're exposed to a lot of new medical terminology. And when they look at all of that, they're often, I always say, you know what, keep a notebook with you, write down the words you don't understand, and then uh, look them up so you can understand the, the vocabulary. And then when it comes to comprehension, when that, they're not able to put those things together, especially reading with speed, accuracy, and appropriate expression. The, the average speed reading is probably around 200 to 250 words. That's probably around two minutes a page. And so now that calls into question, if you have a kind of reader that's, that's slower, or faster would read at different speeds would take longer or faster for them to get through the amount of material that they have been assigned. So the statistics, I just mentioned the, wor the, the words per minute, the 20% of content, but also though our average literacy here in the US is reading at about eighth grade. And you have four out of five in US adults that have English literacy skills that are not necessarily or that's sufficient to complete tasks, but 21% has difficulty, which translates to about 43 million US adults. And the average reading 
level for literacy is eighth grade. Now the implications for that is huge because we recently did a nursing program review for which we are actually seeing disparity gaps with a lot of our students who are not successful fall into about Asian, Hispanic, African American. So like I could tell you that the National Assessment for Education panel would say that a lot of the reading deficiency, you have a good like 35% across the board with Caucasians, Hispanics, and African American that have below literacy rate and plus our state has below international literacy rate. Some of the considerations when I have thought about over time and in, in the making of like the last six years I've been here, find myself really cutting and cutting down the amount of reading assigned to them, like really assigning what they really have to read. However, what's difficult is that there are chapters in the sign reading that are important for foundational information. So for example, if my student didn't get or understand in the first semester of school, uh, course, uh, the pathophysiology of, say, cardiovascular circulation, and now we're talking about cardiovascular disease, they would not be able to build upon the foundation of that basic information as, that they need in order to build clinical judgment and critical thinking. What to teach from assigned readings? I think that teaching essentials and main salient points is probably usually my approach because there's a lot of information, right? There's a lot of detail. Sometimes, you know, I call in a question like, okay, does the function of the the earlobe that hangs off of your ear, you know, on paragraph two, page five, line three really matter. So they need main salient points because they're being taught to be generalist as a nurse and not a specialist per se. So they have to be able to recognize, pick out critical information, read critical information, and then be able to build upon uh, Bloom's taxonomy, which I'll talk about in a second here, what students get quizzed on and tested on. A lot of what my approach is starting off with, you have some recall recognition, some comprehension, but when they start to get into the, the third, especially second, third, and fourth semester, they are building the uh, analysis, application, and evaluation. Nursing is exam heavy, so our test average needs to average a 78% before any assignments or any points are actually, are actually added. Some of us, uh, when they do the HESI entrance standardized exam scores for their admission profile, there is a learner style inventory. There's many different learner style inventories out there, and most of them think that they learn a particular way. So if they jump down to the VARC model, they'll say, I'm a visual learner, I'm an auditory, I'm reading, writing, or kinesthetic. That's actually, I think is important because then it draws off of, for them, their style of learning, how do you tailor to that? For their reason, for, for reading and for Blackboard, I usually have multimodal types of things. So like, okay, there's video clips where I'm drawing and explaining things. There are pre-recorded pre audio recordings on the lectures. And then there's the PowerPoints and or, you know, a case studies for things that they look at. And then there's the application piece in the lab portion when they're kinesthetically actually doing things to apply what they're learning in the classroom. There's also Kolb's learning theory where we are taking, okay, like a concrete experience and they have to reflect and learn that concrete experience, make meaning out of it, and then draw general ideas, concepts, and hypotheses out of that so they can test that in person. Most of them are multimodal learners. They have to use more than one way because they have to use all their sensory input in order to really gain understanding, not just what they read, but also what they're learning all at the same time to build a big picture thinking. I have discovered that students who struggle with, with reading recently have met with, with the learning commons where they have a writing, reading, and speech assistance, especially they have coaches and reading specialists that can actually talk to the students and help them read to do some of the things that's already been discussed, like chunking and looking at text and looking at picking out main salient points. And so in assessment, a lot of times I spend one-on-one -on -one with the student and I ask, I ask the question, first of all, I ask them, well, do you read? Students are very forthright. No, I didn't really read. And when they fail their first exam and then they sail on the second and I say, what did you do differently? And they say, I read the book. And I say, but do you understand what you read? 
And have you had struggles with reading or finding yourself rereading things over again, which I'm going to tie into processing in a second. And I actually go over questions they get wrong and observe them reading. Sometimes you see students that are you know, taking a really long time to process, long time to understand, or they actually think they understand something when, they, when it comes time for them to actually try and teach it back to you, they really didn't understand what they thought they understand. So then it becomes a deconstructed, you know, there's the metacognition we you've heard already and breaking things down in a Socratic questioning. So here's an example of an application question that I wrote for pathophysiology, where I talk, a male patient shows up in the ER, complains of chest pain a week ago, he has cardiac disease risk factors, the EKG doesn't have any changes, but the provider thinks the client suffered a myocardial infarction, which is a, which is a heart attack. And what would best indicate at this time? In a higher application question in nursing, they would have to draw off of two or three two or more pieces of information in order to understand this question. So the deconstruction for me may be saying, okay, what, do you, what, is, what is this illustrating? What do you understand about what symptomatology of a heart attack looks like? They gotta be able and or answer the deconstruction, like pieces of those information and say, okay, how do you rationalize each answer and what does it mean to you? So if you pick A, what does that mean? If you pick B, what does that mean? And so forth. In the accommodations referral, so that's kind of why I preface the, the historical piece because that pro historical piece is, has been used for federal policy moving forward. Some things to think about, asking questions about history. And so having worked with the amount of accommodations students that nursing have, the some of the the assessments I like to make is like, okay, you know what, how, how, how did you do in middle school and high school? Uh, how was your focus and attention? Can you, you know, start a task and finish a task? How did you do in your academics? It's not that I'm trying to single anything out, but I am looking for patterns of behavior because they have discovered that in research, and we, some of you mentioned like brain connectivity, that they have discovered that learning requires these brain connectivity, what they call brain hubs, to actually be, be attached to one of those, kind of like a train going through a transit station, right? You're all connected. And when it's synapsing and when it's sending information, the learning actually is, is being transmitted from one region to the next. And when they're finding that people who have reading or learning difficulties, especially math on top of that, there are cognitive difficulties that those deficits actually may impact their ability to read or behavior related to reading. Some may have a learning disability. So as I watch someone take a really long time to read or rereading and rereading and not understanding their logic and their processing, which ties into processing disorders, because learning disability usually have low to average IQ, but they have some sort of difficulty with an application in an area of what they're learning. And reading is one over time that's actually the improvement you know, has gone down as far as reading goes when assessed by uh, reading panels. Some of them may actually have processing disorders when it comes to reading. So they're reading and it's taking them a really long time. And is it taking a really long time because they don't understand what they read or they are um, or is there a cognitive or executive functioning issue with memory? I can say that a few students in assessment, we send I probably three to five students every eight weeks for accommodation referral. I had somebody come back and actually was diagnosed by the learning or a the learning disability tester who said like the student actually had like dyslexia and ADHD. Another student who's now in third semester that I referred in first semester didn't go for the accommodation testing, but I watched him read and, and the reading was just disjointed. There was not like a, a demonstration of the logical comprehension of that particular reading passage at that moment. And what they have discovered is there was very short, like audible memory issues and, and um, you know, a short 
processing or longer processing issue from a cognitive standpoint. Next, if you have people who have ELL or like, you know, language acquisition, they say best by 10, not to exceed age 18 to actually, and if they're immersed, like for example, somebody who immigrated from another country and is immersed living here, you know, learning English is way better off. But after that language acquisition decreases, however, that does impact though their ability to read, which takes longer processing time. And I watched them sit there, read, and I look at them and say, are you translating into your native language and then translating back into English, which is what they're doing. And then of course, vocabulary and comprehension, which I talked about. So in summary, I, I think that in working with students one-on-one, -on -one, first, I've really tried to look at cutting down the examining the reading assignments, giving them what they really need to read. And then when working with them, now looking at their reading patterns, their behaviors, making further assessments for deficits and gaps. And believe it or not, that gap is, is growing. There are, I have seen actually English teachers in you know, middle school and high school, you know, family members to look at these scores. They have like seven and eighth graders reading at third and fourth grade levels. So which means that they're coming to us now and I, you, you're seeing gaps in reading, you're seeing gaps in vocabulary and comprehension. So while it's not our job to know what their history is, I feel it is my job to look at those gaps and those deficits and to give them the resources that they may need. So we, we go through a lot of study and test taking skills. We go through a lot of like, okay, reading and reading essentials for what's important and, and matching that with the emphasis of what they're learning in the classroom and then following up on the referrals and students. So I have students often where I ask the accommodation centers, you know, that so-and-so follow through with accommodations testings or so-and-so follow through with, you know, uh, examining accommodation because it is, it is necessary for their success and then monitoring their progress. And with us, because they're with us for two years and we, you know, we advise our students, we kind of follow their standardized testing. We kind of follow through their progress and look at what they need every step of the way. And there Judy, are... that was fantastic. Thank you. Was right at 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um... I'd like to open the floor for questions. And if it's okay, I'm gonna sort of exhibit my privilege as the chair of instruction by asking the very first one. There are some really interesting comments in the, um, in the chat box. Um, and I'm gonna try and distill some of that. And I'm gonna ask a question of all three panelists. And I don't even know if we can possibly answer this, but it's, it's sort of interesting. I'm seeing two sort of separate ends of the spectrum here where Jason talked about this supposed joy that can be fostered in reading or even the curiosity that one can have in approaching reading. But on the flip side, you have what he talked about are distractions or what Tim Clifford even articulated as potential trauma, which might prevent someone from engaging with, with um, a particular reading. I'm wondering like to what responsibility do we bear as educators in either promoting the joy that can be had or promoting the curiosity that one should have in, in doing a reading versus on the other hand, are we in some cases potentially harming or even traumatizing our students and having them do readings in, in context which is so limited to school. I mean, I remember like learning to read in grade school where it's like reading was this performance where you would read a paragraph in front of your classmates. And I would imagine that that has the ability to harm certain students and prevent them from actually reaching the joy and curiosity that reading should in fact foster. So that's, that's much more of a rant than it is a question, but I'm wondering if any of you can potentially answer that like to what responsibility what responsibility do we have to promote or facilitate or foster the joy that can be had with reading and what ways what 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 ways are we maybe doing harm to our students um on the flip side of that so well just quickly i don't i don't know that we can i mean i don't know that we would do any harm at this point i would rather not patronize our students and say well you're not good enough to read this that's, I don't, at, at this level, I don't think we have that opportunity right now. We have to somehow get them engaged in, in the field of study, right? The discipline readings, as Judy was mentioning, and it's, it's, it's incredibly important in that aspect. Um, so I, I'm more of, don't condescend them, tell them they can't do this, but you got to walk them through an academic article, 
got to walk him through a difficult text. But the joy of reading is a real issue. And if they don't come with to college with that, how we can do, kind of promote that is a difficult question, right? Um, with younger kids, it's a little bit easier. But the, the reading levels, as Judy mentioned, just severely drop in high school. It dies, right? So we see the highest reading levels around eighth grade, and then it kind of just stays there. And, uh, and so there may be something we have to do in, in high school level, promote within the high school system, that they start at least allowing students. I mean, and don't get me started. They got an issues with te standardized tests and all these kinds of things. But that I think that's it's a hard question to answer. Yeah. I can take a dive at it. Oh, do you want to go first, Judy? No, go ahead, Liz. Sure. Okay. I think um, so. A couple of things. The harm question. I think that is really important. I think students. I see it all the time in my developmental classes right the message we send to them like you're starting college and we're telling you you're not prepared and they are actually very bright students they may have a learning difference they may have life circumstances they may need some extra pieces put in place but i think that is something we need to take very seriously right and i always get the question am i gonna have to read aloud in front of the class and i'm like never right my job is not to make you feel embarrassed and like my job is to give you the tools so that you can have the college and career goals that you want and achieve them. And so in my mind, I think a lot of the, um, the connection between the joy of reading or the motivation of reading comes from two things. One, students not having the tools or the opportunities to practice and not having it be relevant to their lives, right? So I work very hard in my classes to, to read authors and texts that connect to their college and career goals and that reflect their backgrounds and that are not so hard that they can't access them, right? So they, there can be some scaffolding, but it's a moving a step forward. And also in this day and age, we're lucky to live in a time where there are tremendous ways to accommodate students who have learning differences or who are reading skills are lagging, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of research now around like listening to text as opposed to reading. You get a lot from that, right? And so how we can work with students to get them to their college and career goals and provide them the skills that they need so that with things that they care about and are interested in. I think I... I agree with the whole harm piece. I think I, I like to come from the standpoint of making it inspirational, motivational, and fun, and then look at, okay, what's meaningful like to you? And I don't mean like, okay, read what's meaningful. I'll say, you know what, you know, it may be a discussion of like, okay, you know, you were supposed to read dot, dot, dot. And then, you know, there's storytelling, anecdotal, and then we take the reading piece and we turn it into, you know, an applicable discussion that's meaningful for them. And I find that, and I, the course I lead right now is psych nursing. So a lot comes up during this time where also a lot of people get, you know, get referred to counseling and advising. And so when you're talking about that piece, you know, there's also this, this empathetic piece, this piece with like, yeah, this is really hard stuff and life happens, you know what, but, but you can do it. Uh, and we can do it in these ways and we can work together to do it, you know, in ABC strategy. And I think that when we come from that standpoint where it's safe, they, at least for my nursing discipline, they, they come at it as like, okay, you know what, they start to build a confidence and a motivation and inspiration. It's like, okay, I can do this. We're going to take this one step at a time, but, but there is a safety net that's built in there that they they can say and do and say, okay, you know, I didn't read this and I don't understand it. And they actually can come out and say that. And then we work with that. I'm going to, there are, there are a couple of questions here, which I'll ask, but I would also encourage any of you that um, want to field or, or sort of levy your own questions to unmute your microphone and ask. Um, but Christine asks a really good question. We, this was sort of touched upon, but maybe you guys might be able to add to it. She writes, for those of you that are up to date with the research, how much does it hurt if students have a utilitarian approach to reading, that is, I'm reading just because my instructor makes me or I'm reading for a grade. And I, that was kind of what I, Christine articulated it much better than I did, but like to what degree is school like sort of, um, to what degree has school controlled reading so that students think of reading as something they do as performative in a classroom as opposed to, you know, increasing one's knowledge about whatever. 
Yeah, I don't think students, I mean, I think if you start asking them what's reading, they'll start talking about school. But if you can dig a little, like, wait, why aren't you on social media? What are you doing? You're reading, right? Like, I think, I think sometimes the connotations around reading, and I think there has been a lot of, like, if students feel like they can't do it, I, I have to say, I was thinking when you were just talking, Tim, so a lot of students will come back to me after they leave my class for support in their classes going forward. And it is, it is, a trend that I notice is that there's there's no support. Like the teacher will just say, I want you to read this 40 pages in the textbook and be ready to take a text on, test on it. And I, I, it's hard because I'm like, where's the bridge, right? Because someone like that could take away from there. They're not going to go into their career because now they're like, I can't do Psych 101. I can't take it all. I mean, I'm just using, I don't even remember what the courses are, but right. So like that piece of, we, we do need to scaffold it for students and we do need to provide them opportunities to be successful and think about what they are really going to need in their careers and their lives and how we can build on the strengths that they bring because they have so many, I mean, they do read, they read all the time. And it may not be the way that we think, right? But there are tremendous things in there around like multimodal editing and like things that they will use in their careers that they can teach us that we can build on. For the nursing discipline, I find that most students don't read just to read. And that's usually the first thing when, when they say, do, do I have to read? But I said, don't read just to read read for understanding and read for me. And they kind of actually have to, because if they don't, the next class is building on the information you just learned from this class. And if they didn't grasp that, they will struggle from class to class. And we see that not only just in like their patterns of testing, but also in their standardized testing as well. And so I, 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 again, I try to pose it in the manner of like, you know, I, it's meaningful read for understanding and then we have to dissect that like you said Liz, some of that scaffolding i gotta dissect that and then deconstruct it in a manner that they build on top of it and that they understand it and then critically think about it uh, tim would you like me to read your question or would you like to to ask it yourself uh no i'll go ahead so you know one of the things like thinking back on my own experiences with reading is that I think I've been able to progress because professors or friends or family members even have challenged me with certain texts. And um, I, I try to do the same with some of my students, but not in the sense, I know Liz, you were talking about like, well, that's crazy. You're asking your students to do like 40 pages of reading and there's no bridge, there's no context. I, I'm not asking that of my students, but I tried to tell them you know, yes, this text is gonna be difficult. I've read it several times and I'm not sure that I completely understand it either, but you're gonna go and you're gonna try it out and then we're gonna come back to class and we're gonna talk about it as a class. But I, I don't know, I'm, I, I guess what I'm asking is, isn't there some sort of, am I thinking wrong? Isn't there some virtue in pushing students and saying, yes, you might have no idea and background knowledge about who Sigmund Freud is and you might not be used to the kind of conventions of 19th century literature, but I'm going to have you read Civilization and Its Discontents. I'm going to have you read a couple of those chapters because you need to get comfortable with, there's going to be a moment when you don't have a teacher there and you're going to read something that you're not quite getting and you have to be kind of okay with that rather than just shutting it down and saying, I, there's, I have no interest in that or that's boring to me or that's too hard. I can't even get through the first couple of sentences, so forget about it, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I, in, in reading theory and instruction, they talk about, it's like the, you know, like the zone of proximal development. It's the same with reading, like things that are at your instructional level and your independent level. And it, it is good, right, to push students and have that instructional level where you're asking them to go beyond. You're not asking them to totally do it on their own, but to, you know, I want you to push yourself. And then there's also a lot of um, research around them, like, allowing the space to, to sit in the discomfort and not make it punitive, right? Like this was really hard. What was confusing and what did you get out of it? And then by the end of our discussion, like what, you know what I mean? But not have it be like a punitive thing of, but, but I think it is really good for students to sit in that discomfort, not like you're in it, but to see like, look, you can do it. And I think they do because they're, a lot of them are so new at having to do that kind of reading that the instinct is to shut down because it's hard and it's overwhelming and the vocabulary, but some sort of like a little bit of scaffolding. And then 
noting what was hard and what you could do and then talking about like so what what did you do to to make meaning out of it right but i i don't think it's bad to push students i think it's that fine line between like too much or it's just like so easy like i i know this it's that like instructional level you know but i think pushing students is fine as long as it's not like so like punitive and then they're screwed in the class or whatever so like Judy and and Jason, could you guys talk about that a little bit too? Like, where is that threshold? Because Liz, I think that's really interesting what you're talking. There's the fine line between overwhelming our students to the point that you're just you're shutting it down. There's no way they're going to come to the table. And then also pushing our students to go beyond that eighth grade learning level and saying like, this is kind of, you know, you have to get comfortable, with, like you said, the sort of cognitive dissonance or the discomfort, you got to get comfortable with that. But can you guys talk about where that line might be or how you gauge that line? That line is potentially individual um, for, for a number of students. And that has to do with their vocabulary, their background vocabulary, their background knowledge. It depends on how difficult the test is. Going to be. I think the, the fine line here is high stakes, you know, the high stakes of reading something like you were talking about. If you're, if you're going to test them on that the next day, this is going to be traumatizing to some degree. Right. But if you're going to if you were going to discuss it, and you're going to actually illustrate how you're confused by this passage or that passage. Then they're going to start seeing, oh, I'm kind of modeling what the professor's doing to some degree. And uh, that can be, I think, somewhat helpful to them. And the discussion in and of itself can help them go back to the text and see what it is, how they might have interpreted what they read after that. And so if you make them go back to the text, that might also be. But it, I think it's a real where you find that zone of proximity is, is uh, somewhat individual, I think, depending on their particular background knowledge, and, which is huge to their reading ability. Some of this too, I think, is probably dependent upon the empathy of the instructor, because I think what, what Liz was saying earlier, Tim, is that you, it's almost like you can't expect your students, you can't just drop Freud in your student's lap and say, all right, come back tomorrow and talk to me about it. Like what you're doing is you're, you're giving them some pretext to be able to say, this is going to be really hard. It's going to be challenging, but sort of unpack what you can. And so I think just de delivering a reading to them with that sort of understanding and empathy is going to give the students the, the sort of excuse to be like, it's okay not to understand everything. I'm not going to test you on this first thing tomorrow. You're gonna to come back and explain to me what you got, what you didn't get, and we're gonna talk about it. And that then is I think going to lend itself to what you want is to challenge your students in reading harder texts, you know. And Tim, I'm gonna second Jason there. I think it is very individualized depending on their their experience like where they're coming from i i mean i you can have i guess someone who had you know only been a country for five years and don't understand the vocabulary but they're but they are motivated and they're trying to learn that comprehension that understanding versus somebody else who can just sail through listening and sail through the reading really fast and then don't have to go back to it i think that is so individualized but again i i agree with tim a lot of it is is I like to test on today, okay, well, what do we go over? I sometimes, for me, that pedagogically makes sense because they may read something and not understand it. And here's the one rule I go by. If I read it and I don't understand it, like, do I expect them to understand that same technical level that, like, I didn't understand it? And I might say, this might not be an important main salient point that I need you to pay close attention to, right? Need big ticket main points for, like, what is the idea? What is the concept? And what is the application? Uh, Mary Anderson, can I put you on the spot? You're sort of our uh, ad hoc reading expert, sort of our, we'll call you the fourth panelist. I'm wondering if there's anything that you would either add or contribute or challenge what any of your, your colleagues have said here. Well, you know, I teach a study skill seminar with um, Maureen Waller, two nursing students. And so I know some of the things that they're faced with. So the nursing component to this is kind of familiar to me. And one of the things that, that I point out to students in that class that I think other instructors might be interested in is something as simple as showing the students what the textbook offers them. 
and not every textbook does this, but the nursing um, textbooks have on the first page, um, the text starts, the, the reading starts like at the bottom of the page and most of the page is taken up with other stuff. And my first reaction is, oh good, I've got one page I don't really have to read. But the information on that page is a list of objectives. And if you don't know what you're supposed to get out of that chapter, if you read the objectives, it's, it's like our um, ACFs. By the time you're finished reading this chapter, you should be able to identify, explain, analyze, show, demonstrate these things. And if you don't know how to read a textbook, if you have those objectives in mind and you start reading the text and you realize, oh, I'm getting an answer to this objective or this objective is being explained, then you're getting out of the textbook what you need to get out of it. So um, to simply say, um, read the textbook without offering any guidance, something similar to that, um, I, I think is, is doing a disservice to students. And if you, if you simply talk about, you will encounter difficulties, this is a difficult te text, without sharing your own experience, without, without going a little more deeply into what your problems were with the reading, give an example of where you found the text to be difficult show the students that this is the kind of difficulty you might have, get them to think about the concepts that they're reading and using those concepts in a new context. Those are the kinds of things that I think um, will help students realize that reading can be um, profitable for them. And utilitarian to me means not reading because the teacher makes me, but the utility in reading is, is um, being able to take the test then and do well on the test because you understand the material that you got because you read the text. So, um, well, those are some of my thoughts. It's really, I wonder to what degree does K through 12 not do this. And I think what you just said is really interesting, like teaching students to really sort of understand the material nature of how a text is delivered. It's not just necessarily the first word of a chapter and the last word of that chapter that the students need, but all of the sort of superflu superfluous stuff that surrounds that abstracts and objectives and table of contents and index and, you know, all that, all that stuff is sort of part of the picture. And I wonder, I wonder if students are not being taught that they're just sort of expected to read what they see on that page. Well, I did visit a middle school once and asked, they had a reading program. They had their language arts class. They also had a reading program. And I asked if in that program, like a did they spend a quarter of the term or one semester or anything like that where you are learning to study read? No. Everything in the reading program was um, reading books of their choice, which is wonderful. Um, maybe doing some kind of project where you show that you read the book and understood it, but it was all fiction. Um, I don't think that students even chose nonfiction. I don't know if there were nonfiction books to choose from, but reading to a to a certain extent in middle school and high school is um, reading fiction. And um, uh, Maureen and I both said, I never learned how to study, never had a class in it, never had any tips on how to study when I was in high school or I think middle school is the place for it, but I don't think that in the curriculum, there's there's a place for learning how to study. Judy? Yeah, I was gonna say that a lot of what we're seeing, especially coming into nursing on a huge learning curve in the first semester is that, what were they taught in high school? Let me teach you a lesson and let me have you regurgitate it. So they're coming in now trying to memorize massive amounts of information. Now in the nursing field, I'm like, 
if you don't understand it, that's not going to stick for you later. But for K through 12, and, and I share this story because I fought a whole year for my son who has an IEP in second grade. What I notice is that he reads something. So I read with him every night and I said, tell me what you understood what you just read. Like we have to chunk it. And then I say, well, what does this mean? And then how does this relate to the previous chapter? Because most of what they're saying is he is an auditory processing disorder where he can't discriminate. He doesn't learn auditorily. So he actually, I noticed he would be applying something. And when they were starting to abstract think in third grade, he would get the same types of word problems, but he would get one right and then can't do the others, even though it's the same type of problem with different numbers then you ask him to read something and they're like well but he's reading like at grade level or above that I said that doesn't mean he understands what he's reading and that doesn't mean he can make the connection from chapter four to chapter two he read you know two days ago and I said ask him to explain what this means and then ask him to connect it to the chapter that he read two days ago and he won't be able to tell you or he won't be able to make the connection so they're looking at essentially what I feel is reading just to read and then okay they're able to pick out the text but that's just in time reading though so it has to carry over and it's not carrying over so they're like yeah in that moment in time I had you read something and yes they regurgitated or they explained what they meant at that point in time but now let's say a few days later you say hey remember when we talked we read that book and a few days ago we read this chapter and if you have somebody, especially who doesn't learn auditorily or maybe have like cognitive or, or memory issues in that processing, they won't be making the connection. So they're reading just to read and they need to really go beyond that. So it's, it's a fight all the time. One of my pet peeves is the distinction between reading and comprehending or reading and pronouncing. Reading is comprehension. If you can pronounce words, if you can read fluently and pronounce words, doesn't necessarily mean you're reading. I was just going to say that decoding and comprehension are very different things when it comes to reading. And if a student's new to the language, vocabulary, it's all about decoding. And your working memory is tied up in decoding, not comprehension. Until the fluency kind of starts to come, then the comprehension, then, you know, just because they can say what the words sound like, to Judy's point, doesn't mean they're understanding it. And fact of the matter is, if they're if they're new, then that's somewhat normal, right? The, my working memory is tied up in decoding, which is fine. I mean, for for instance, for a second grader, I think that's normal. But you're right; there is this aspect of how do I tie it to what I already have read or know or experience, and how do I tie it to my vocabulary? It's a real issue, and and that's how comprehension starts to develop. And so these two things, it, it, it's a lot about what's, what can be done in working memory. So. Uh, are there any other questions from the field? We're sort of running up to uh, 3.30 here. Going once, going twice. All right, well, I just want to say that I, this was a fantastic conversation. I found it incredibly intriguing, and I certainly uh, owe a debt of gratitude to Jason, Judy, and Liz for sharing your experiences um, in uh, delivering these your, your talks and also talking about this like, highly relevant and important uh, subject. So um, hopefully we can all sort of reflect on this and then go back to our own classes. And when it does come time to assign readings to our students, we sort of recognize a lot of the strategies um, and support structures that we can we can implement in our own classes. So, um, okay, happy Wednesday. I appreciate all of you for being here. Um, stay happy, stay healthy, and um, hopefully we'll see you guys. We probably won't have another panel this semester, um, but we hope to see you guys once we hit the reset button and start delivering these again in spring 2021. So thank you, everybody. Be good. Thank you, panelists. I thank you. Thanks.